Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host. Welcome to the Cube Plus NYSE, the AI infrastructure and hardware leaders in Silicon Valley program. This is where I'll get together and talk to the best experts, uh, newsmakers, technologists here in Silicon Valley, and then we're going to connect it to other parts of the world. Right here joining me is Vijay Nagarajan, who's the Vice President of the Wireless Connectivity and Broadcom. Also got a great sub stack, check him out. You can search his name there. He's got great content there. Uh, Vijay, thanks for coming on the program. John, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with theCUBE and I really look forward to talking with you today. You know, Broadcom obviously makes chips, semiconductor industry. Congratulations on great business performance. The stock's at an all time high. All my friends that love me because I gave them a Broadcom stock tip, not that I had any inside information, I said, you should buy Broadcom. And they're like, thanks, that was two years ago. So they're, they're very thankful. Um, but we saw it coming. You're in Silicon Valley, so perfect to be part of the leaders. You're the head up the wireless connectivity division, so you have access to the product roadmap, product marketing. You got the keys to the kingdom over there on wireless. On the wireless side, yeah. absolutely. And it's super important. We all have wireless. We all love our Wi-Fi. We all work on our phones and devices are becoming more important than ever before. And so you're starting to see this, the end-to-end -end workflows with Gen AI really be part of the big narrative. So it's no longer just devices, smaller, faster, cheaper, good power, faster connectivity, but it has to be part of the integrated distributed computing network called the internet. That is absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, I, I tell people, I mean, whenever people talk about AI these days, I tell them, you know, there's no AI without Wi-Fi, there's no AI without edge broadband. I mean, essentially, everything from the edge to the core have to work together and in a very connected fashion. And, uh, you know, technologies like Wi-Fi or cellular, yeah. they become super essential for that entire value chain. You, know, you go back a decade ago or so, when Wi-Fi would crash at an event or someone's place, people would freak out, where's the Wi-Fi? You know, because they didn't have the good 5G back then, but now you got great connectivity, both on the spectrum side and on the unlicensed side. So Wi-Fi 7 obviously is on the, on the radar. You're seeing that, those connectivities really be faster than ever before. That's going to touch all humans like, because we all have our phones. We all know when we have bad reception on, on the cell towers, and obviously with connectivity, you can have great bars, but if it's ba backlogged, and at the choke point, which is the backhaul, you could be like stuck there too. So there's so much going on in wireless that people, there's a lot going on. Explain from your standpoint, what's the technology in, in wireless these days? We all know the, the connectivity piece, but there's a lot more than that. So it is a lot more than that. I think you said it right. Uh, I think if you step back and look at it today, you said so, right? So 10 years ago, you know, when somebody, uh, you know, encountered a Wi-Fi issue, they'd scream, but this, right now, more so, right? It's not just somebody at a conference, it's my daughter, it's my 11-year-old at home, it's my seven-year-old son at home screaming if Wi-Fi doesn't work. Now, and if you step back and look at it, Wi-Fi on your phone, on your client device, on your PCs, speeds have gone up by 100x in the last two decades, just phenomenal. And uh, it serves every use case that you can possibly think of. And you know, uh, as uh, Wi-Fi as a technology has always been, um, should I say, ahead of use cases, if you may. So uh, if you scroll back to 2007, 2008, when mobile was uh, taking off, you know, that's when um, you know, Wi-Fi uh, made sure that, uh, the Wi-Fi wi industry, that is, made sure that uh, the technology would work very well, not just for connectivity, but for mobile connectivity to be able to you know, work on your phones. And that really spawned the smartphone uh, revolution, if you may, alongside cellular. Um, fast forward to 2012, um, you start, you know, you want to watch video on your phone. It's not just about sending emails, it's not just about browsing internet, but you actually want videos. <laughs> That's where 11AC comes in. If you look at it right now, it's Wi-Fi 4. There were specific technology elements that were put in place to make sure that you're able to download video onto your phones. Fast forward another five years, you see that you know uh, people no longer just want to watch content, but they also want to upload content. You are in the era of WhatsApp and Instagram and whatnot. You're uploading video. So now there needed to be a nuts and bolts redesign of Wi-Fi that uh, not only uh, enabled you to download video, but also upload video with the equal quantity, quality. Um, and that was Wi-Fi 6. So that's when Wi-Fi 6 came up. If you look at it now, you're talking about AI and you're talking about you know, AR and VR. Mm -hmm. um, all of these use cases, if you step back and look at it, now calls for better latency, you know, better network capacity. 
And that's when a technology like Wi-Fi 7 comes in. So we're right now running the seventh iteration of Wi-Fi, where the focus has now gradually moved from speeds and feeds to coverage to now more of latency and capacity. Uh, that's what the latest generation of Wi-Fi does, is make sure that you have very highly reliable, low latency, high, high speed wireless connectivity at the edge. You know, one of the things I love about Wi-Fi is the standard, and I know there's a lot of standards go into it. I'll say smaller, faster, cheaper, and making that um, form factor. We all relate to the smartphone. We see how it gets better on every vision, better camera, better chips inside. It can run video, things are happening. Certainly with Genevieve, there'll be some processing power needed there at a whole other level. Um, but I recently, Charlie Kawaz from Broadcom uh, presented on a, an event we uh, streamed and held with Juniper Networks, one of your partners, um, and he, did a great job you know, talking about some of the future speeds and feats in networking, AI networking specifically. Um, but he brought up Ethernet. Because mm -hmm. Ethernet and Wi-Fi, they're, they're cousins, they're, they're standards, it's Ethernet. It's just it's wireless, wireless Ethernet. It's just wireless Ethernet. It's just wireless Ethernet. Okay, so Ethernet has become <coughs> like, I mean, I don't know how many times I can count in my lifetime where people said Ethernet's dead. Okay, um, and, but it's not dead, it's only getting better. It's become standard. This is where the throughput comes in. So he talked more about the servers and networking, which is the big data center you guys are doing well in. But when you get to the device, the compatibility and the standards and the ecosystem and the time to market are huge factors. I know you work hard on that. Can you share some insight into what goes on in that? Because one, you got to meet the standards to level up with performance you need it. But there's also ecosystem. And we have an ecosystem, rising tide floats all boats. We all know that. So take us through inside Broadcom and what goes on to make it all work? Sounds good, that, that's, a, that's a great question, broad question, but let me try to answer it. <laughs> I think it would help to answer that in the context of what has happened in the Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6 e world. Um, so if you look at any uh, transition, any, um, see, when, whenever you go device the next generation of Wi-Fi, when you go construct the next generation of Wi-Fi devices, um, I'd say primarily there are three vectors that we'd have to focus on from a Wi-Fi standpoint. One is uh, standards. So uh, all of the Wi-Fi standards originate in the IEEE, the 802.11 standards, and then they migrate to uh, an organization like called the Wi-Fi Alliance. And the Wi-Fi Alliance, are, again, a set of companies coming together to make sure that you know, certain features from the IEEE standards are taken together, put in place, and they make sure that the uh, devices are interoperating with each other. So that's standard. So uh, we come together with a bunch, we're on the board of the Wi-Fi Alliance. We make sure that uh, the transition from one generation of Wi-Fi to another happens every four years, working in tandem with the infrastructure networking, making sure that the speeds and latencies match up to what the core of the network needs. Um, so that's one. Secondly, um, because Wi-Fi is wireless and it's very closely tied with spectrum, we also have to do as an industry substantial work in making sure that you know, spectrum is available for unlicensed access. So we work in tandem with you know, other companies to go to the uh, regulatory bodies worldwide to make sure that they open up new spectrum. Case in point being, uh, you know, uh, for about two decades, a better part of two to three decades, there was only two frequency bands, 2.4 gig and five gig bands, like a small swath of spectrum available for Wi-Fi. The industry saw the need for newer uh, spectrum, uh, more, more spectrum needed in order to make sure that there are better speeds and feeds and better latencies. Uh, there was an opportunity to go work at, in the six gigahertz band. So we, along with um, a set of like-minded industry leaders, have been at it from 2016, working with different regulatory bodies to say, hey, here's what you can do with the six gigahertz band. If you open it up to Wi-Fi, here's the economic benefit of Wi-Fi. And so, uh, you know, in four years from 2016 to 2020, we've been traveling worldwide to go make this happen. And in 2020, April uh, was when the FCC opened up about 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum for Wi-Fi. And then since then, about 70% of the world's GDP has opened up the six gigahertz band from the Wi-Fi. So that's regulatory. The, second, the third thing with all of this is product development. So it doesn't matter that there's new spectrum. It doesn't matter that that's new standard unless you have a new product. So what we end up doing is um, you know, ever since we started these discussions on the regulatory front from 2016, we've also been working on the products from 2016. So Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6 e products have been in place within Broadcom for those four years. So when FCC announced the availability of the 6 gigahertz band in 2020, April, we had our chips ready. We had our products ready to go to go you 
know, fed into our customer devices and run with it. So these are the three, you know, vectors that we have to go look at for Wi-Fi. And what this results in are a set of devices that are extremely good in their features, not just their features, but also their KPIs, whether it is size, power, mm -hmm. um, and performance. Mm -hmm. And this really helps because for us, when the, when, uh, when the technology wins, our products also win because we, we've been working the products in tandem with the regulatory and the standard yeah. bodies. And I want to talk about how um, scope the complexity of that because it's not trivial to stay in, t in, mar in line with the market on the regulatory side. It's like a moving train sometimes, you got to be honest. So doing that development in parallel or just near real time with the standards is tricky. Talk about how, un unpack that a little bit because it's not sure. clear. This, the obvious that, that no that that no you you bring up a good point I think see there are two aspects to it again one you have to pack a lot more features um, into a chip uh, case in point being as we've moved from Wi-Fi 5 to 6 to 6c the bandwidth in itself increases from you know 80 megahertz to 160 megahertz to 320 megahertz so the radio design changes um, so for us you know we have to incorporate the fact that there are a lot more features packed in, so we make a process note decision up front. So we have to go extrapolate what is needed on the feature side and say, okay, you know, in order for us to make Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 6 e work, we have to go with a certain process note so that we make that decision. To top it all, the because wireless involves a substantial portion of analog, um, the fact is, even if we go with a new process note, the compression doesn't happen automatically. The, sh the shrink doesn't happen automatically. So we invest very, very heavily in changing or advancing our radio architectures going from one generation to another. The shrink that we offer on the radio has to work in tandem with whatever we can get on the digital side going from one process node to another. So essentially what happens is we pack in all that complexity and still you know, we're bound on the phone side, for example, by the size constraint. Hey, you know, this is a small device yeah. with a certain battery consumption. So you put all of these things together, and yet I only want a chip that's less than 20 square millimeter, for example. Yeah, exactly. So packing it all requires that we work, you know, those four years are actually spent in shrinking this chip and making sure that we it hits all the performance metrics. Yeah, it's complicated. Everyone wants this faster, and we all experience in our lives you know, either at a big venue where you get bars or like some vendors don't work better than others. You s connectivity wise, speed seems to go slower. Those are all changing with Wi-Fi 7. Right. Um, but your customer is also the OEMs and also the, their end user customers, the ones that either feel the pain or love the pleasure uh, of good bar good broadband. I mean, you know, I'm a broadband junkie, self-claimed, I never knows that. Um, so I love the bandwidth. I want more faster, I want faster bandwidth, lower power. Right. Um, Talk about the roadmap because this comes back down to like the innovation side of it. <laughs> you have OEMs. How are you meeting their needs? Because you know um, they want the best product, uh, and they have constraints. They have their devices. They work with you. Can you share just the innovations? You know, um, for growing the demand side of the for high performance, lower latency. What are the demands of your customers? So and OEMs? Uh, I'm happy to talk about the roadmap, but before that, you mentioned something which is, hey, they want. You know, your customers want the best products, right? So the fact is, the customers want the best products, but Wi-Fi is sort of different in that while I am selling to a, a customer, to an OEM, in reality, it's you and I as consumers that really need to like Wi-Fi. Yeah. So, you know, as much as I evangelize Wi-Fi to my customers, I also have to talk about it in the context of my mother. How is she going to use Wi-Fi, you know? How does she know that she needs to go get the latest and greatest on Wi-Fi? So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the roadmap, but one of the things that we ended up doing, John, is, you know, if you if you go back six years in time, and if you were to talk, if I were to ask you, hey, what Wi-Fi are you using? E you are stuck in an alphanumeric soup of 82.11n yeah. and 11 ac Centrino. Uh, exactly. <laughs> the old days. So we had to reset that, John, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the things we did, we took the lead in terms of, you know, going to the Wi-Fi industry and saying, hey, this is not working. Let's go make sure that you know, we actually put in place a generational nomenclature for Wi-Fi <laughs> so that, you know, I can go tell my mom that, you know, six is better than seven and seven <laughs> is better than eight. That really sets it's up. Like, it's like oxygen. You can smell, the, you can taste the good air when it's fresh. That's and, right. And Wi-Fi should be free, it should be fast. That's right. I, I call it the elixir of modern <laughs> life, right? It, it really is. Now, just 
complementing well, it. Well, to your point though, this is important, like little nuance, because the end user is ultimately, the, the end user test, that's the, the model, our, our, our family, our non-techies. So just solving the OEM problems might not solve their problems. Exactly. So you have, okay, I meet the constraints, but the design's got to be good systematically. The that's system right. architecture should be locked and loaded. That's my point. So the roadmap for me has to be determined by how much I mean, what the consumer really wants and what applications I'm looking at, right? So having said that, um, when I go look at the roadmap, again, let me break this down into the clients, which is like the phones and the PCs and also the access devices, the routers and so on. So on the phone side, the requirements are relatively um, contained in that, okay, you're looking for higher performance, better performance, lower latencies, I mean, all the KPIs that you want, but you know, constrained by power consumption and size. So you want to make sure that your chip is not just low power, but also that it occupies the smallest real estate because you're contributing that much back to battery real estate, mm -hmm. if you may. Mm -hmm. So those are the constraints with which we operate and we make sure that we're working through the, you know, uh, you know the process node transitions, radio architectures and whatnot that I just described. We go from, you know, Wi-Fi 6 to 6E to 7 to 8, making sure that, uh, uh, that it meets these KPIs. Now, on the phone side, what we also need to be mindful of, you know, we talk a lot about Wi-Fi, but my chips are really Wi-Fi and Bluetooth combination cards. So the same chip, not just as Wi-Fi, it also has Bluetooth, and those two technologies coexist in the 2.4 gig band and increasingly in the 5 gig band as well. So I need to make sure that those two devices uh, have a seamless coexistence as well. I, you have to be able to browse your internet while you're listening to music or taking a phone call on your headset. So all of those things have to be baked in when I go look at the roadmap. Um, so, uh, so that's so latest and greatest technology in Wi-Fi, latest and greatest technology in, road, uh, in Bluetooth, they all come together in terms of complex radios. Mm -hmm. just, just to give you context, my first Wi-Fi Bluetooth combo chip had maybe two radios, one for Wi-Fi, one for Bluetooth. My current chips actually have anywhere from seven to ten radios on the phone because there's that many chains of Wi-Fi, that many chains of. Bluetooth. I mean, that's hard for people that don't know wireless. Having the radios on the chips are really difficult to do because most people don't realize they have their phone. Um, the big antennas that they see can have to shoot the signal over the air through the air interface, they call it, and the phone has to talk back. That's it's right. got to drive the battery has to drive the packets back that's to right. the antenna. That's right. So you can have a powerful antenna blowing signal everywhere, but you got to actually and get back and do a handshake. And, and by the way, you need to do all of that within the regulatory constraints that yeah. are posed by the FCC and other bodies. So all they of that has- They crack down a lot of guys overdriving the power, because that was one strategy, trying to get you power out, that. but one, but you still get the device has to talk back, or the That's repeater, right. or whatever you want to do, the, That's the right. CPE, whatever. Um, okay, let's talk about the the, the, the the chips and the design. So you more in the smaller packages. Everybody wants to be a chip company. Mm -hmm. um, custom silicon is a big part of your success at Broadcom generally as a company. So um, I'm imagining that with Edge and the OEMs and the broader Broadcom strategy um, with custom silicon, that you guys are probably working on deals with people to have a purpose built because you're starting to see with generative AI for devices or IoT for instance, there's roles and use cases that may not need stuff or need more of this or that. So like. It's a diverse set, it's not a general purpose. Here's the chip, go do something. Um, what's, what's the role of the wireless in context, say the broader strategy of uh, Broadcom? And the fact that you know, IoT, you're going to have cameras on poles, you're going to have this you know, powering windmills. Right, you know. so there are a couple of vectors that I want to touch on. One is that as far as wireless connectivity is concerned, one size does not fit all. Right, so the, the configuration of Wi-Fi being used for your phone, high-end phone is different from the configuration used for the mid-end phone, it's different from what is being used on the IoT devices, is it one stream of Wi-Fi, is it two streams of Wi-Fi? Um, and on the flip side, when you take the access points, it's as complicated, do you, are you going to use two streams, three streams, four streams, so you're going to operate in single band, you're going to operate in 2.4 and 5, are you going to operate in you know, three bands, four bands, there are all these questions that have to be answered, um, uh, which lead to complexity in the decision-making process. Um, when, uh, when you go look at it from that perspective, um, we put in place roadmap for the phones, and then uh, for um, 
the IoT class of devices, we do have adjacent products that we do offer as uh, licenses to our partners that go um, use it. On the flip side, um, the custom uh, development comes more from the perspective of uh, software and firmware customization, making sure that it works for specific operating systems on the phone side or the PC side, um, and also on the access side being fine-tuned for specific OEMs. So the customization has to do more with firmware and software, uh, less so with hardware, simply because it is uh, standards-based, if you may. Um, the performance but benefits. But cycle times are getting shorter, though, these days, compared to they were years ago. I mean, I saw some of the work you guys are doing, you go from concept to market. That's right, and that is, again, that's something very similar to what we've done on the infrastructure side. This is something, because we've been shipping combos for the last 15 years on the phone side, so we've mastered the sort of art of getting products very, very quickly <laughs> out the door. Uh, and also the Wi-Fi standard itself, you know, from a cycle time perspective has compressed where uh, one generation of, the, the time between one generation of Wi-Fi and the second is about four years now. It used to be six, seven, and that's compressed. So that's leading us to do faster uh, timelines as well. You're the VP of Broadcom's wireless connectivity division. I didn't say Wi-Fi division. That's right. So I have to ask you, 5G is proliferating. You're starting to see more uh, radio frequency blanketing, you know, metro areas, rural's getting lit up. Mm -hmm. um, super exciting, I mean, broadband's everywhere. So as these, as the ubiquity of broadband, mm -hmm. it's going to have different frequencies and different unlicensed and licensed spectrum. Uh, how do you guys integrate with say 5G? Because this becomes a big part of it. Because seamless integration, you don't want to lose the continuity of workflow if That's packets right. are moving across one network. That's right. And then there's overhead involved, you don't get it right. There's a lot of things going on in, in chips that's right. Take us through the innovations. Where's the, one, how's the integration go with 5G and, and licensed? And then where's the innovation? Yeah, got it. I, I, I think first up, um, the, a good portion of the integration or the sort of seamless, say, handoff, if you may, between Wi-Fi and, um, and cellular has to happen at a platform level, whether it is on the phone side or on the infrastructure side. So largely driven by our OEM partners. What we make sure is, you know, as a chipset vendor, we make sure that there are enough, that is enough signaling that happens across these uh, different connectivity technologies. I talked about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but same thing, you know, we want to make sure that we have enough signaling um, going from the Wi-Fi chip out to the host, where the host is able to then discern, okay, this is when Wi-Fi is operating, let's make sure that the radio frequencies don't interfere, so there's cellular and Wi-Fi coexistence as well. That's something that we work on. Now, also keep in mind that we do have a sister division that does uh, radio frequency filters that go into, I mean, they, they do radio frequency filters for uh, cellular devices. So essentially, that's another component of this yeah. so-called interoperability and so OEM integration. So OEMs can pick and choose and just divide if they want to put it in there. That's right. So that's what they do. And then, you know, obviously it's also complicated, John, where different countries have different bands, so there's a mix and match involved with respect to this <laughs> filter selection that the OEMs do. It's a complex, great area if you're a techie out there and you're interested in solving hard problems, wireless is a great area. Um, you've had a great career, Broadcom, got a great Substack, been following it. Um, obviously been following all the, the chips you guys have been making, you know, pretty much every device out there. Um, what do you optimize for in your job um, in, in Broadcom? Uh, both on the Broadcom side and personally, because you got a lot going on. You got the product roadmap, you got to get the requirements from your OEMs, but still satisfy the end user customer. You got a complex distributed computing architecture that's global and diverse, mm -hmm. many levels, both device and network. Mm -hmm. And you got to build the best chips. What do you optimize for? That's a that's a good question, John. I think I had to think about what do I optimize for on the, um, let's, let's just say, if I had to pick one word, I think it's satisfaction. And I think on the professional side, it is satisfaction of the customer, right? So customer yeah. first. What 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 does the customer want, right? Best. And, and the best, best and that's what latency. You know, that's less, what we try to deliver. Power. So, um, exactly. All these KPIs, time to market. I think for me, I think personally, on the Wi-Fi side, time to market is important, and that goes hand in hand with how we work on evangelizing the technologies because what we believe is if I can get the best performing chip out there first to market, then if the technology wins, my product wins. So uh, essentially making sure that the customer is satisfied with the best. So that's, you know, professionally, roadmap wise, it's the customer satisfaction, number one. 
Uh, personally, too, it's the same thing, John. I think it's satisfaction, it's contentment, what makes me happy, that's, that's what I go for. Yeah. That's awesome, and the tech's fun to play with, too. You got a lot going on, and it's important because it impacts people's lives. Right. I think I love the, 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 the famous meme going around where you had the Maslow's hierarchy of <laughs> needs, and at the bottom, before food and shelter was Wi-Fi wi -Fi. and connectivity. Um, and that brings me you know, the, to the enterprise side. I love, love the data center stuff you guys are doing in the cloud, stuff that Broadcom's doing at the you know, large scale, uh, Gen AI. Ethernet is a big conversation. And I want to get your thoughts on this from a personal standpoint, because in my 30 plus years in the industry, uh, I grew up on Ethernet. And I actually worked for IBM when Token Ring was around, two megabits. But the thing is, is that Ethernet's been around, but it's gotten better and, 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 and it's open. What's the importance in your opinion of open standards and ecosystem? And uh, to the naysayers that say, hey, Ethernet just doesn't cut it for this next gen, whether it's on-premise wired Ethernet and networking like Juniper switches and stuff, and MIST, which is cool AI, to Wi-Fi and wireless. No, um, and open is it. I mean, you, I mean, Charlie said it best, right? And we've talked about this. It's open, scalable, and power efficient. And, and that, that sort of mantra runs right from the edge all the way to the core. I mean, essentially, if, it's, if a technology is not open, if the technology is not standards driven, it doesn't spawn a vibrant ecosystem mm -hmm. that gives choice and satisfaction to the customers. And I think that's where, I mean, that's where, you know, our, our head is at with respect to Ethernet, Ethernet as well. I mean, talk about UEC, just making sure that, you know, um, Ethernet meets the needs of what the AI data center requires and also making sure that that vibrant ecosystem exists on top of it is a very critical yeah. element. It's the same thing that also, you know, pervades our Wi-Fi roadmap as well. I think if, I, if this is not standards driven, it's not going to be interoperable. And if it's not interoperable, then you don't have a technology that is widely adopted, that is so dearly sought yeah. after by everybody. And if done right, it's a disruptive enabler because innovation always disrupts, but also adds value. Adds with, value. On top of it. Okay, personal question. Um, what's the coolest thing you, you're working on right now um, that you'd say is cool, like from a tech perspective or um, product perspective or a technology innovation perspective? What's the coolest thing you're working on? I'd have to say Wi-Fi 7. It can't be any other answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I mean, uh, jokes apart, I think. Yeah, what about it that makes it cool? I mean, give us, give us the cool, cool ability it's, factor. It's the, it's the fact that, you know, this technology is geared to address everything that, or everything that is sought after from an AI perspective or from a future use case perspective, whether it's AR, VR, whatever. Um, it's, it's a redesign of Wi-Fi that focuses on latency, that makes latency a very critical KPI. That's not been the focus so far with Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a techno there's a particular feature called uh, multi-link optimization, MLO, uh, which makes sure that you, are, you have multiple lanes available across frequency bands. Think of it like carrier aggregation for cellular. Uh, being able to aggregate traffic across different bands to make sure that you get very reliable, very yeah. low latency traffic, which to me is incredible. I mean, every time I work on Wi-Fi, John, I feel like the industry and the companies are thinking ahead yeah. of use cases the market would want, and that's what we need to be because if, because the use cases originate at the edge, the use cases originate with the consumer. If the edge technologies are not capable of it, then I think everything falls apart. So that excites me. Quite it's a bit. innovative. It's always had really strong. Every year, there's something new happening. Remember the old days, you have to configure channels. You know, on the on the devices, and then right. got now smarter, and now you got a lot of Wi-Fi pockets. But Wi-Fi is still limited by distance. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's where the spectrum comes in for backhaul and other kind of things, right? So that's we feel good about that. Things are going well there in the market. You feel good that we're in a good position. Yeah, I mean, again, Wi-Fi is sort of a last mile technology, right? So you you know the the fact that you have good broadband backhaul coming in uh, to the home mm -hmm. to your enterprises that can be complemented by Wi-Fi, that's, that's phenomenal. Um, if you look at the fact that this new six gigahertz spectrum has actually given us uh, substantial bandwidth that will allow us to have wider band Wi-Fi, which means greater speeds. From an enterprise perspective, uh, John, if I step back, it's not just about higher bandwidth, but it's also about having more number of larger bandwidth channels. Mm -hmm. um, so if you looked at 2.4 or 5 gig, if you look at a 5 gig deployment in the enterprises, typically people use 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz bands, very small bandwidth. 
which means you need more access points, lesser devices per access yeah. point. With six gigahertz coming in, you have 80 megahertz channels. You have, you know, you can have, you know, 10 of those, for you example. You get plenty of throughput. And so you get plenty so of throughput, plenty throughput. of capacity. All right, now let's get into the security side of it because that's, that's also concern for mm -hmm. enterprises, mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. and out in the open. I mean, I was at the Black Hat event, all I kept thinking about was, oh, I hope I'm getting hacked. But there's security in Wi-Fi. Give us the update on the security component. I mean, the security from a, from a Wi-Fi perspective, it's fairly, uh, standardized in that, you know, the Wi-Fi Alliance makes sure that um, the uh, the protocol has been put in place with respect to, say, WPA3, for example, um, is there. And uh, uh, since it's standards-driven and it's interoperable, I think... Uh, uh, I, it's standards-driven. It's, standards it's standards-driven. All right, yeah. so let's go to the, the big factor. Everyone on their, during the iPhone days would blame Apple and, or the chip on the Wi-Fi chip or the uh, LTE chip, cellular chip, for draining the, the battery. Mm -hmm. Batteries are everything, right? Battery power. So this is also a sustainability conversation. You guys always optimize for good use of energy, but it doesn't matter on devices because you, batteries are a critical part of the power to keep the devices on, whether it's a phone or Absolutely. an IoT device. Absolutely. It's huge. Absolutely, it's critical not just on the phones and uh, phones and IoT devices, John. It's also critical, it's becoming increasingly critical on the access point side as well. Uh, if you take the phones, as I said, I think we're, we're optimizing consistently on reducing the power, but also the footprint so that there's more battery life put in. Um, the, that, that has been one of our unique selling propositions, if you may, is just making sure that, that any, any, any communication that happens is low power. Um, we talk in terms of energy per bit. We want to make sure that we're conveying that bit mm -hmm. over to you with as less power as possible. Mm -hmm. That brings in the sustenance component. Now, if you look at the architecture, it's not just about you know, how, how much energy it takes to transmit the bit, it's also about how much energy the chip takes when it's actually asleep, when it's not doing anything. So we want to make sure that every operational mode of this Wi-Fi chip yeah. is absolutely optimized as we go from one generation to another, one process node to another. And as, as you said, it's just complex, and we had to work on each of these nits to make sure that we're providing that yeah. sustainable yeah. chip that is extremely good on the back to life. Well, Broadcom put all the pieces together. I know there's an HP legacy I learned at the investor. I worked at HP for nine years back when it was the HP way, and, and uh, a lot of techies working on hard problems at Broadcom. Um, final question, last 30 seconds we have. Uh, what's, what are you working on now? What's next for you? What's on the radar? What are you trying to get out the door? Uh, the, the next, of course, is Wi-Fi 8. I mean, like I tell my mom, it's six is gone, seven's here, eight's next, so I'm working on it. So, of course, we're working on Wi-Fi 7, and we're working on 8. But, I mean, I, I also work on, you know, the latest and greatest on Bluetooth, latest and greatest on GPS, GNSS. That's all part of my portfolio. Uh, Bluetooth, this exciting things happening with Bluetooth, but, you know, uh, things like channel sounding, where you're making sure that, you know, Bluetooth helps with your keyless entry type use cases. Those are all exciting. And then you couple it with some of the overall um, AI use case driven uh, technologies that we're putting in place as Broadcom as a company, right from the edge to the core. It's just exciting times, John, exciting. It is, uh, your mom would be proud of your career, what you're doing, helping, helping get broadband out to the masses. No, uh, thank you. for sure, for sure, she's mission. proud. Yeah, she is super proud and so <laughs> is my Entire family, my wife, children. Give a shout out. It's great. The family, <laughs> they're all watching. Yeah, I mean, thank you all. I think, uh, you know, they've been, they've been super essential, John, for my career. It's my, my parents, my wife, my yeah. children that bring joy every day. I mean, without them, I wouldn't be doing Wi-Fi. Vijay, you're a great, great guest and AI leader in Silicon Valley and love what you do. And again, I love the mission, bringing broadband to the masses, making it faster, smaller, more, more power uh, uh, sensitive to, to our needs and end user. We all love our Wi-Fi and went wireless. Thank you, John. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you for having me today, and that uh, was a good conversation. Thank Great. you. This is part of the Cube's Palo Alto Studio, Silicon Valley AI infrastructure leaders, part of the the Cube and NYSE Wired Community Events. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.